Second up is our French fame lab winner, David de Villa, a neuroscience student. When asked after his victory why he entered fame lab, David said, because it's so much fun to get on stage and tell people why the brain is cool. It never stops being awesome. As you'll gather from this, David is not French. Uh, he's from California, but he's now studying neuroscience in Paris, and we're not researching the brain or chatting about it with friends. He's actually doing stuff about it online as the co-host of the Brain Drain podcast. His immediate reaction after winning the French final was to yell, I'm going to move on to Cheltenham, baby. He, he has, and now he's moved on to the international final. So get your brains, especially your visual cortices, up to speed for the Californian French fame lab fusion of David de Villa. Uh, hi, uh, I'm David, and uh, I don't know how many of you saw my talk last night, but I publicly confess to being both a neuroscientist and a huge nerd. And, but the thing about being a nerd is, is that it means that you just get rationally excited about very specific things. So yeah, I start to freak out when I hear about a seemingly normal middle-aged man whose response to a question is, tono, 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 right? It's exciting. <laughs> but as silly as he sounds, the tono, tono guy is A, real, and he's on YouTube, and you should look him up because he's crazy. But two, it's actually a really interesting case study in how language is represented in the brain. But case studies like him don't come along very often. And because language is actually really difficult to produce, from the specific movements of our tongue to the very tiny movements of our Adam's apples to make vocal emotion happen, the question becomes how do we study language separately from the actual act of speaking? Well, when we think of language, we usually think of spoken language, like English or French or Chinese, but actually, Studies in sign language actually give us really fascinating evidence on how language is represented in the brain because it's a non-spoken language. Oppositely, Bonobonga has all these specific mouth movements and vocal emotion, but he still lacks language. Bonobonga actually has damage to what's called Broca's area. It's a well-studied part of the brain that's known to be involved in speech production. And when people have damage to this part of the brain, they seem like they know what they want to say, but they just can't get it out. It's actually really bad for pain lab speakers. <laughs> <laughs> but the really fascinating thing about Broca's area is that even though we already know that it's involved in speech production, a recent study found that just as speakers activate it when they speak, sign language speakers activate their Broca's area when they want to make signs. That is to say, as far as your brain is concerned, sign language is just the same as any other spoken language. It just requires a different set of muscles to express it. Because of this, therapists who specialize in autism have actually started to teach autistic children sign language as part of language therapy. And they find that in this way, they can avoid all the complex features of language while still teaching language. They see that children who are taught sign language actually learn English faster than those who are only taught English. With all this in mind, I have to wonder, why do we call it sign language? It helps us communicate like every other language, and the brain treats it the same as every other language. Maybe it's time to shift our mindset on sign language by simply calling it well done, David. Being able to deliver the talk in spoken language and sign language simultaneously is, is, is a great skill. Can I ask you something about the science itself? You, su you seem to suggest that whatever language we speak, mm -hmm. uh, it's the same parts of the brain that are, that are being activated. Is that right? Yes, as far as Broca's area particularly, you see consistent activation across different languages. And so where, where does the difficulty, of, you know, once you've learnt a particular language, learning a foreign language later mm -hmm. in life, given that presumably it's the same concept, same parts of the brain, mm -hmm. 
Is it just to do with practicing sounds that we find difficult to... Okay, so, uh, no, actually. In fact, you would imagine that practicing sounds would definitely be something related to the production of speech. But while Broca's area is really just about taking the language, the lexicon, the system of grammar that you know, and producing speech with it, um, uh, there are completely different areas of the brain that are involved as well with uh, the dictionary of words that you know in your brain and the system of syntax. Some of it is found in Broca's area, but there's a lot more uh, plasticity that you need to build in order to build a second language, as you might know. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you about another area of your brain. So okay. what can you tell us about Wernicke's area? Oh, okay, one, I'm really glad you asked that. <laughs> okay, so Wernicke's area is the second part of the brain that has been widely found to be known associated with language. Maybe you knew that, and maybe that's why you brought it up. But uh, in regards to sign language in particular, it's been seen that we all, uh, Wernicke's area has been implied with the understanding of language to some extent. But with sign language speakers in particular, even though uh, usually it's related to the auditory cortex, there are connections between those two places. In fact, Wernicke's area for those who speak sign has more connections and more co-activation with the occipital lobe, the part that is related to visual input. And so you see in this way, their input for language is not the ears, but the eyes. Really, we're all out of this language.